Senator Sanders, there's been some back and forth between you and Hillary Clinton over an ad you're running. In the ad, you say there are two Democratic visions for regulating Wall Street. One says it's okay to take millions from big banks and then tell them what to do. The Clinton says you're breaking your vow not to attack her. But isn't this essentially the charge you've been making against her for months? Yes, it is. And I think anyone who looks at that ad understands that it's not a negative ad. It portrays a fact of life. And that is there are parts of the Democratic Party that have taken a whole lot of money from Wall Street, pushed the deregulation of Wall Street, oppose the reestablishment of Glass-Steagall and breaking up the large banks. It is a simple and truthful statement. Let me challenge you on that, though, because aren't you making a character attack? You're essentially saying the money she takes compromises her positions. No. What I am saying is that there is a division within the Democratic Party that has gone on for many, many years. And I'll let people determine whose side she is on and whose side I am on. I have led the effort when I was in the House against the deregulation of Wall Street. I have stood up to Wall Street, and I believe that when you have a handful of financial institutions with so much economic and political power, they have got to be broken up. But just so I'm clear, you do think the donation she takes and the relationship she has financially with Wall Street is compromising? I think that people in selecting a president of the United States have got to take a hard look at their entire careers and where they get their funding from. There is no great secret. Hillary Clinton has received a lot of money from Wall Street and other very powerful special interests. I receive virtually all of my money from small individual contributors. And they should do that because? Because there is a reason why. I mean, let's not be naive. There is a reason why powerful special interests make contributions to candidates. I am very proud that we do not have a super PAC that we have received more individual contributions than any candidate in the history of this country at this point in a campaign averaging 27 bucks. Do I think that is an important consideration for voters? Yeah, I do. Let me ask you about an ad that, that Hillary, I, I, oh, sorry. sorry. It's very obvious, isn't it? Is it it's shine? No, you know what? Shine. I think he's a great there, commentator. Yeah, that, uh, I think it's a great discussion, <laughs> even I though apologize. his hair is. I really apologize. And then there's this here. Right here. All right. over America, people will say, my God, that a hair? <laughs> What's going on with American democracy? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Eugene, anyway, why are you worried about his hair? Look at my hair. <laughs> They're not going to worry about his hair. Right. Eugene Debs never, right. <laughs> never had this problem. Eugene Debs never had that problem. All right. Ready? We ready to go? Yeah. Okay. We good? All right. Hair's locked down. <laughs> All right. We good? Okay. Hillary Clinton has her own ad in which she says President Obama wants to make sure gun manufacturers can finally be held accountable when their guns are used to kill our children. It's time to pick a side. Either we stand with the gun lobby or we join the president and stand up to them. I'm with him. Is she talking about you? Well, possibly. I think she might be, and I think that's, you know. But the answer is, as I... Wait, know, you say you know. What? No. I don't know. Of course she is talking about me. I don't know who else she's talking about. Uh, but the answer, of course, to that is, as she well knows, I have a D-minus voting record from the NRA. I probably lost an election, statewide election, here in Vermont because I was the only candidate who said back in 1988 that we should ban certain types of assault weapons that are sold for military purposes, and that I, of course, strongly support the president in his executive order to make sure that guns do not fall into the hands of people who should not have them. She is talking about the liability provision, whether gun manufacturers should have special liability. There is a House bill by Adam Schiff, and, uh, and there's also a Senate version of that that repeals the 2005 law that shields gun manufacturers. Would you support that? We're going to take a hard look at that. And what I have said before is there are a number of provisions in the original bill that I voted for that I'm not crazy about and I want to see changed. There were some provisions in there, including uh, safety locks uh, to protect children, uh, armor-piercing ammunition, that I think must stay in that bill. I, don't, I want to make sure the police don't get killed by these uh, kinds of ammunition. Uh, but yes, of course, we're going to prepare to take a hard look at that. If there could be a bill that would just strip liability completely, would you be OK with that? Well, there are provisions in it that I want to make sure are still in it. For example, if you have a mom and pop gun shop in northern Vermont, small business, who 
and they sell a gun legally to somebody, and that somebody has, does something terrible with that gun, should that small business be held liable for the action of that individual? I think not. Do you think that some people are trying to use the removal of this liability protection as a way to basically, a backdoor to put gun manufacturers out of business? Well, again, that's an interesting question, and I, I can't give you a full answer. But once again, if you are a small gun shop owner in Vermont or rural America, and you sell legally, somebody goes through an instant background check and legally sells a gun to somebody, goes through you know, the background check, and that person then does something terrible, should you hold that small gun shop owner liable? Frankly, I don't think so. I think that's wrong. The Clinton campaign is essentially making the charge on you on, about guns that a version of the one you're making about her on Wall Street. They're saying you voted against the Brady Bill five times, you voted to put this liability protection in place, and that when the next thing comes up, you are, are not as strong on the issue and your instincts aren't where hers are on this. What's your response to that? Well, my response, again, is that I have a D minus, that's D as in David, D minus voting record uh, from the NRA. I have voted to strengthen uh, and expand the instant background checks. I voted to do away with a gun show loophole. I voted to ban assault type weapons. And I now believe that we have to move very vigor vigorously in terms of this straw man situation where people are buying guns legally and then selling them to criminals. I think my record is very strong. Let me tell you something else. Coming from a rural state, which has virtually no gun control at all, I think I am in the strongest position of any candidate to bring about the consensus that is needed in this country where the vast majority of the people are saying, you know what, guns should not fall into the hands of people who should not have them, people with criminal backgrounds, people who are mentally unstable. Given your relationship with gun owners, what do liberals not understand about gun culture? Well, they don't, maybe some of them don't understand that in a rural state, not just Vermont, not just New Hampshire, but all over this country, you have husbands and wives and kids who go out and they hunt. And it is a way of life in my state. A majority of the people in my state own guns. Uh, vast majority, 99.9% .9 of gun owners uh, are not criminals. They don't use their guns in illegal ways. And I think it's important to understand, you know, that some folks, you know, maybe in New York City sit around and they, you know, drink fancy wine in very expensive restaurants and so forth. Other people go out into the countryside and they enjoy that environment. It's part of our way of life, and that should be respected. Gun purchases have gone up quite a lot. That's yeah. not just all hunters. No, that's right. There's no question about it. I think there's a lot of fear in this country. Uh, you know, what we saw in San Bernardino uh, touched a lot of fear. But look, I would say, look, no question. When you have 30,000 people a year uh, who are killed as a result of guns, many suicides, but we've seen these terrible mass murders. You know what? It is a very important issue. But the other issue, frankly, John, that is on people's mind is the collapse of the American middle class. It's why millions of people are working longer hours for low wages, terribly worried about the economic future for their kids. And you know what they're saying? They're saying the rich get richer, almost all new income and wealth going to the top 1%. They are seeing a corrupt, and I use the word advisedly, corrupt campaign finance system in which billionaires are now buying elections, spending unlimited sums of money. I'm talking about hundreds of millions of dollars to purchase elections to make the rich even richer. Those are key issues to my campaign, and I think we're going to do very well because the American people are responding to those truths. And because of those issues, you want to reform Wall Street, and I want to try and link the two here. You say Good. because you understand the gun culture, you can be a bridge between so the liberals and, and gun owners. Hillary Clinton made a, a version of that argument about Wall Street, and she said because she understands Wall Street, she can, and she told me this last week, uh, regulate Wall Street, and she said it's kind of like Nixon going to China. So why doesn't she have standing to regulate Wall Street? Because she comes from and understands, she comes from New York and understands Wall Street. Well, it's not Nixon going to China. That is exactly the opposite. Nixon was a vehement anti-communist who went to China. Hillary Clinton is somebody who has received significant sums of money from Wall Street. But she said she went to Wall Street and told them to cut it out in right, 2007. Right, cut it out. Well, you know what? Cutting it out is not good enough. Give you an example. Just give you an example. Literally today, uh, Goldman Sachs, it was announced, is paying a $5 billion fine, $5 billion for uh, their duplicitous work on subprime mortgages, $5 bucks. We have had in the last not so many years 
two secretaries of the Treasury, one under a Democratic administration, one under a Republican administration, who came from Goldman Sachs. We have dozens and dozens of people in government who came from Goldman Sachs. And what the American people are seeing is huge bailout for Wall Street, while the middle class continues to disappear. We are paying the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs, while, while pharmaceutical industry lobbyists are all over the place. You've got a Republican Party that cannot deal with the reality of climate change because they're afraid of losing their fossil fuel campaign contributions. This is a corrupt campaign finance system which makes the rich richer and almost everybody else poorer. Let's switch to taxes for a moment. Your tax plan, you haven't put out your rates for personal income. Republicans say they could be as high as 90 percent. Well, that's a lie. I know. Well, Donald Trump has said that over and over again. I, I don't want to shock you on this one, John. Just because Donald Trump says it may not be exactly the truth. That happens to be a total lie. We will get it out, but let me talk about taxes, because we have probably put out more information on taxes than any other candidate already. And what we are saying is that we're going to end this outrageous provision that allows big money interests like Wall Street firms to park their profits in the Cayman Islands and other tax havens, not in a given year, in a given year pay a nickel in taxes, we're going to end that. And we're going to use that money to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure, create up to 13 million jobs. Wall Street may not like it, but we are going to impose a tax on Wall Street speculation so that we can make public colleges and universities tuition free and substantially lower interest rates on student loans. So we have already put out a number of tax proposals, I believe more than any other candidate, which will help us transform American society, demand that the wealthy and large corporations stop paying their fair share of taxes. So we'll see rates from you soon. You will now. see that, absolutely. But it is not, this is nonsense. I will not go as far as Dwight D. Eisenhower did who did have rates at 90% for the upper echelon, the very top of our society. You've raised questions about Hillary Clinton's plan for paid uh, family and medical leave. Yeah. What's your concern? Well, here's the concern. She doesn't have a plan. That's the concern. Uh, She'd the con say the same thing to you about taxes. You, you, you we're still no. waiting to get your rates? Wait, but there is a difference. We have, we have presented, I think, more specific tax proposals than any other candidate. But in terms of family and medical leave, here's what you got. The United States is the only major country on earth that does not guarantee paid family and medical leave. Now there is a bill in the Senate uh, brought forth by Senator uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, bill in the House, Rosa DeLauro's bill. We have 20 sponsors in the Senate. They have, I think, 114 in the House. It is the bill that is moving. And what it says is we will guarantee three months paid family and medical leave. Is it free? Of course it's not free. We will. The cost of it will be about $1.61, $1.61 a week for the average American worker. I think that's a pretty good investment. Hillary Clinton chooses not to support that legislation. But she has her own plan, and her really? plan is to tax people who have oh, benefited no from... Oh, no kidding. I have not quite seen that plan. Well, it's out there. And no, in it's fact, not it out says, there. It says that she'll take the money from taxing those people who benefited from the economic inequalities, which sounds like a Bernie Sanders plan. Well... It's not a Bernie Sanders plan. It doesn't go anywhere far enough. It's not a plan. It's a vague idea. But here's the further point. If you want a program that is ingrained, ingrained in, in American fabric, the fabric of our country, you look at Social Security payroll tax. You look at Medicare brought forth by Lyndon Johnson uh, payroll tax. If you want something to be long-lasting and where the people have ownership of it, they know nothing is for free, you're going to have to pay something for it. When you do something like a vague idea, oh, we're going to tax the wealthy on this one, it could disappear tomorrow. So, but isn't that how you're playing for infrastructure? We are going to tax the wealthy and pay uh, for but infrastructure. But that's Why a very that different paid? proposal. We are saying that over a five-year period, we need to invest a trillion dollars in rebuilding our infrastructure, creating 13 million jobs. Look, there's nobody out there. I don't think Hillary Clinton will deny that my proposals will demand a lot more from the Donald Trumps and the other billionaires in this country than any other candidate that's out there. All that I'm saying, when you're looking at a program like paid family and medical leave, look at it in the same way you look at Social Security and Medicare. There should be a very modest payroll tax, which I think most American workers would be delighted to pay. Healthcare, when you hear Chelsea Clinton say, as she did this week, that you want to dismantle Obamacare, dismantle the Children's Health Insurance Program, dismantle Medicare, dismantle private insurance. I know, leave millions and millions of people out there with no health insurance at all. Yeah, I, 
I've only been spending my entire life making sure that as many people as possible get health insurance. That is just an unfortunate statement uh, that Chelsea Clinton made. Uh, but here is the story on health care. There is one major country on earth that doesn't guarantee health care to all people. We have 20, that's the United States of America. We have 29 million people uninsured. We have even, we have 29 million people who have no insurance at all, even more who are underinsured, and yet we end up spending far, far more than any other country on health care. We pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. The Affordable Care Act, which I helped write, which I voted for, supported, has done some good things, no question. But we have got to go beyond that. We've got to join the rest of the industrialized world, health care for all as a right, and we can save the middle class families thousands of dollars a year in their health care costs. Your plan for health insurance <coughs> relies, if, if we look at your 2013 legislation, relies on the governors implementing a lot of this. The Clinton campaign would say they didn't implement a lot of portions of the Affordable Care Act. Why would they implement yours? Not accurate. Our plan says, yes, we want it to be decentralized. We want the states to play an active role. Read our legislation carefully and what it says, if the states don't go forward, the federal government will. This is more like the ACA, the Affordable Care Act's exchange, health exchange program, not Medicaid. This is a 50-state program guaranteeing health care to every man, woman, and child as a right. We have just been through seven plus years of debate over health care. It got pretty ugly. It got pretty ground down. Is the country really ready for another fight of that order, which would probably happen if you put your... John, no one has ever heard me say that this is going to be an easy struggle. You're going to have to take on the private insurance companies who make billions off of health care, pay their CEOs exorbitant salaries. You're going to have to take on the drug companies, the three major drug companies made $45 billion in last year in profit while charging us the highest prices in the world. This is not going to be an easy fight. So here's a promise. We will not pass Medicare for all on the first day of office. Got it? I promise that. That will not happen. It's an ongoing struggle. It is a vision consistent with people like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Harry Truman had said. Health care is a right for all people. We have got to have the courage to take on the insurance companies and the drug companies. It is going to be a tough political fight. I don't deny it. But to say that I'm going to dismantle the entire health care system, you know, that is just not true. We're going to guarantee health care to all people as a right. Donald Trump says unless he wins, all of his efforts will be wasted. Do you feel the same way or do you feel like already you've had an interim achievement? Well, I think uh, we stand an excellent chance to win. Uh, I believe <laughs> we started this uh, campaign, as you well know, at like 3% in the polls. Uh, we are now ahead in New Hampshire. I think we're closing the gap in Iowa. I think we have a good chance to win both those states. I think we have a good chance to win this election. So to answer your question, it's a hypothetical. I think we are going to win, and I think the reason that we are going to win is that people are sick and tired of status quo politics and economics. They want a president who has the guts to stand up to the billionaire class and start representing working families. But do you think you've achieved something already? Well, every day, I think. We, when we see at our rallies, uh, in some cases, 25, 28,000 people coming out, when I see young people coming out, who want to get involved in the political process. When I see working people tell me, you know, I had given up on politics. I wasn't going to vote. Thank you for running. Uh, you now have my support. Yeah, I'm very proud of, of in increasing excitement and belief that in a democratic society we can make real change. When you were at the State of the Union, did you think that might be maybe up there? Actually, the thought did cross my mind, honestly. <laughs> it did. Uh, and, you know, it's a very humbling uh, experience, feeling. Uh, but, you know, we're running hard to win. We think we have a good chance in Iowa and New Hampshire, uh, and we think we have a good chance to pull off what will amount to, I think you will agree, one of the great political upsets in modern history. Did you just think about it and that's it, or did you start making plans? Yeah, well, I was jotting down my inaugural speech. And I, oh, that's just, you know, no, not quite. <laughs> It's, it's a long way to go before we talk about inaugural speech, before we talk State of the Union speeches. Yeah. You have suggested you are the more electable Democrat yeah. in a general election. Yeah. What is it about you, Bernie Sanders, that makes you more electable? You know, here, when I won re-election um, uh, in 2012, I won with 71 percent of the vote here in Vermont. About 25 percent of Republicans voted for me. And I think we have an appeal to young people to working class Republicans, to Democrats, obviously, to independents. And I believe, number one, that the polls show right now that I am stronger than 
Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump and many other Republicans. That's number one. And number two, the only way the Democrats are going to win is when there's a large voter turnout. Republicans win when there's a small voter turnout and people are demoralized. I think what we are seeing in the Sanders campaign is a great deal of energy and excitement. It will translate into a large voter turnout. Large voter turnout not only means winning the presidency, it means reca recapturing the Senate, doing well in the House, winning governor's seats all over the country. There's a perception that you have a weakness on, on foreign affairs. Is that something you need to improve as a skill to be president, or are people just misinformed about it? Well, you know, I don't think I have a weakness on foreign affairs. Is it true that Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State for four years? Yes, of course. Does that give her a great deal of experience in foreign affairs? Obviously, it does. But it's not just experience. It is judgment. In 2002, Hillary Clinton was in the Senate. I was in the House. And we were asked to vote on one of the major issues in the modern history of America, and that was the war in Iraq. We both listened to the same evidence. We heard from Bush and Cheney and Rumsfeld. I listened to what I, they had to say. I didn't agree. I voted against, not only did I vote against the war in Iraq, I helped lead the opposition to that war. Hillary Clinton voted for that war, one of the worst foreign policy blunders in the modern history of the United States. So you know what? Judgment counts when you're talking about foreign affairs. I am not quite as much into regime change as Hillary Clinton is, uh, and I think we need to have a large worldwide coalition to destroy ISIS. I do not believe the United States can do it alone, and I will resist us getting into perpetual warfare uh, in the Middle East. You said Donald Trump is a pathological liar. Yeah. Why specifically? Well, I'll give you one example. I mean, there are, when he goes around telling people that I want to raise their taxes by 90 percent, that's a lie. Never said that. It's not true. Number two, more importantly, he is trying to divide this nation, okay? And he tells us that the, that the Mexicans who are coming into this country are drug dealers, they're rapists, they're criminals. I mean, that's just a lie. But even worse, he goes around saying, I, Donald Trump, I saw on television thousands of Muslims celebrating on 9-11 when the Twin Towers went down. It's a lie. There is no evidence. There was never anything on television. It never happened. He has not apologized. He keeps saying it. That is a pathological lie. She, he said some pretty tough things about Hillary Clinton. Do you think you benefit from that at all, from the tax? His I don't need Donald. I don't want to benefit from anything that Donald Trump says. By the way, he has said some very tough things uh, against me. Uh, but people should know that not only is somebody like Donald Trump trying to divide our country up, telling us that Muslims should not be able to come into this country, that Mexicans are, are, are rapists and criminals, but also what they should know is this multi-billionaire thinks it's good public policy to give huge tax breaks to the top two-tenths of one percent, hundreds of billions of dollars. This guy, one of the richest people in the country, doesn't think we should raise the minimum wage, which is now seven and a quarter an hour. He says in a Republican debate that wages in America are too high. Wow, really too high. People are working longer hours for low wages. He thinks they are too high. So I think once we get Donald Trump in a room to look at what he stands for. I think that the polls right now, last poll had me 13 points ahead of him. I think that number will increase. All right, Senator Sanders, thanks very much. Thank you very much, John.